Song of Invitation will be number 89. 89. <coughs> As you know, Don Blackwell's with us. Most of you know who he is. If you didn't, you probably wouldn't be here, so we won't take any, any more of his time. Brother Don, if you would, preach the word. Good afternoon. It is good to continue our worship services today. One o'clock is a challenging time to speak, and I think that you know why. Everyone has just gotten their bellies full. Normally, this is the time that you are starting your Sunday afternoon nap. And so it can be challenging. But what I have done is I have picked out a few names of people. And if I see anyone drifting, I'm going to call a name out. And uh, I'm just kidding. But that would keep people awake. I am thankful to get to talk to you this week. I'm looking forward to the rest of the week. We'll be here through Wednesday night. And then, Lord willing, on Thursday, Sherry and I will be driving home. I appreciate the kind remarks after the lessons this morning. You're very warm and uh, encouraging congregation. And I appreciate that uh, so very much. I want to talk about a phrase and see if you've heard this in recent years. Have you ever heard someone make the statement that if the church doesn't change, it will die? You ever heard somebody say that? I've heard people say that a number of times. It's usually not in a good way that they will make a statement like that. In fact, for several years now, the word change has kind of been a buzzword in the Lord's church. I remember in the early 90s, there was a group of people who called themselves change agents. These were people who were members of the church, but they had made it their mission to change the church. They were trying to, to alter the Lord's church into something different. They were a group of people who would say, the church doesn't change, it will die. Now, because of people like that, the word change became almost a, a bad word. It became almost, almost a byword amongst conservative brethren. And change became almost synonymous with liberalism. And it got to the point that people were opposed to anything if it was new. When I first started preaching uh, about uh, 25 years ago, we didn't have PowerPoint like we have here today, but we had the old overhead projectors. You know, you'd write on a piece of uh, wax paper and with a pencil, and it would, you, you remember what I'm talking about. We had those. So when PowerPoint started coming along, not all congregations had it. And so I would do, go to, to do a gospel meeting, and I would call in advance, and I would ask the church, do you have PowerPoint? And I remember one particular congregation, I was going there, it was in the Nashville area, and, and I called one of the elders, and I said, Brother so-and-so, do you all have a PowerPoint that I can use for the gospel meeting? I'll never forget what he said. He said, uh, Brother Blackwell, we don't get into that liberal stuff around here. <laughs> There's nothing liberal about PowerPoint. Why did he think that? Just because it's new, it's different. And so because something was new, he was opposed to it. When I was preaching for the Lord's Church in Charleston, South Carolina, we ordered the paperless hymnal where we could put the songs up on, on the board. And I remember some of the brethren saying, well, that's liberal. There's nothing liberal, whether you look at it here, whether you look at it here. There's no difference. It's just technology that we're using. Now, I want us to consider for the next several minutes... Uh, this afternoon, this statement, if the church doesn't change, it will die. Is that a true statement? Well, the answer to that is, is yes and no. Now, I want you to hold on. I don't, I don't want you to panic when I say that. I want you to listen to the lesson. We're going to cover three points this afternoon as we think about this. If the church doesn't change, it will die. First, what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you some areas that the church cannot change. Secondly, I'm going to give you some areas that the church has to change. And then finally, I'm going to give you some areas that, that are optional. The church could change. All right? Here's the first one. We're going to talk about areas the church cannot change. Now, I'm going to begin. I'm going to give you a general statement, and then I'm going to be more specific. The general statement is this. We cannot change anything that is doctrinal. You see, when we talk about change, the Word of God doesn't change. John 12 and verse 48, Jesus said, He that rejecteth me and receiveth not my words hath one that judgeth him. The word that I have spoken, you know what the rest of it says? The same shall judge him in the last day. You know what that means? The same word of God that we're using, that they used a thousand years ago, that was produced two thousand years ago for the New Testament, that same word of God is going to be there on the day of judgment and we will be judged by it. That means the message Jesus spoke in his lifetime, that same unchanging message is going to be the one at the judgment day, and we better not try to change it. 
Matthew 24, 35, Jesus said, Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. The gospel will not change. And the Lord is so very serious about this that He says in Galatians chapter 1 and verse 8, But though we or an angel from heaven... Now think how serious that is. Though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which you have received, let him be accursed. We cannot change it. That's the general state. Now let me be more specific. What do we mean when we say we can't change anything doctrinal? Let me give you some examples. Number one, we cannot change the one church. We can't change that concept. I guess about 12 years of my preaching career, I preached in the Carolinas, North and South Carolina. And I guess in all of the years that I was in the Carolinas, there was a fellow right up the road from us named Jeff Wallen. He was in Charlotte, North Carolina. He preached for the Providence Road Church of Christ. I guess it was the biggest church of Christ in the Carolinas. Jeff was one who was a self-proclaimed change agent. He was one who told people, if the church doesn't change, it will die. The problem was Jeff wanted to change the wrong things. So on one occasion, I went to see Jeff. And I expressed to him how troubled I was by his desire to change the church. And he said to me, he said, Brother, if changing the color of the carpet from blue to green saves souls, then I'm in favor of it. And he walks off. The problem was, that's not what he was talking about. And I knew that's not what he was talking about, but he didn't want to discuss it with me. Many people who have sought to change the Lord's church both in the 90s, the 2000s, and even still today, what they're saying is we need to be more inclusive. They're saying we need to include denominational people. We need to count them as brethren. We should openly fellowship and embrace them. I've got a number of quotes that I've saved from Jeff Walling because I've had a lot of dealing with him. I want to read to you what he says about this. Direct quote. He says, I really want you to get used to being with a lot of Christians because in spite of what some of my brothers think, There are going to be a ton of folks that God is going to give grace and mercy to. I don't think a small crowd. As he was addressing Jesus' prayer in John chapter 17, where Jesus prayed that all the disciples would be one, Jeff Walling said this, There are two odd things about the Lord's request, that all of them may be one. Say it with me, will you, that they all may be one. The problem is when we say we, what if we are at a gathering where the people sitting next to us don't go to a church of Christ? Now, they believe in Jesus, they love the Lord, but they're not fellowshipping in a building that says Church of Christ on it. Free up your minds for that bizarre possibility. Do you see what he's saying? He's saying we've got to be more inclusive. But you see, the problem is we don't have the right to change the one church. Matthew 16, 18, Jesus said, Upon this rock I will build my church. Two things, it's singular. Secondly, it's His What if you had guests in your house and you came home from work and they had a sledgehammer and they were tearing down a wall in your kitchen and you walked in and said, what in the world are you doing? And they said, I think this will look better. I'm going to make some alterations to your house. And you're going to say, you can't do that. They would say, why? You say, it's my house. You can't come in and change my house. You see, that's the problem. The church is the Lord's house. It's His. We don't have the right to make changes to his house. Ephesians 1, 22 and 23 refers to the church of Christ as the body of Christ. Now get this, church of Christ is the body of Christ. If it's the body, it's the church. If it's the church, it's the body. Ephesians 4, 4 says there's one body. Now if there's one body and the church and the body are the same thing, what do you have? You've got one church. We don't have the right to change the one church. Now, we could do a whole sermon on that one, but let me move to the next one. Number two, we don't have the right to change the plan of salvation. Now, for 25 years, at the end of almost every sermon I have ever done, I have always said, in order to be saved, you've got to hear, believe, repent, confess, and be baptized. That is taught in the brotherhood because the Bible teaches it. Listen to what Jeff Walling says. He says, Jesus did not say that the obedient might be one. Jesus did not say that the church of Christers might be one. Jesus prayed for all of those who believe. In order to teach the text, you can't get out of this lesson without appreciating the fact that Jesus asked that we would throw, listen to his words, that we would throw a calf rope around all of those who just believe. You see what he's saying? He's saying we got to be more inclusive. Don't pay attention to this plan of salvation. As long as they believe, it's going to be all right. 
The problem is, Mark 16, 15 and 16 still, still says it's necessary to be baptized in order to be saved. 2 Timothy 2.10 still says baptism puts us into the place wherein is salvation. 2 Peter, 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 21 still says baptism doth now also save us. Number three, we don't have the right to change the organization of the church. Now, God has said that the church is to be organized with elders who lead, deacons who serve, preachers who preach. Those elders must meet the qualifications in 1 Timothy chapter 3, Titus chapter 1. Brethren, we don't have the right to change those qualifications. We don't have a right to add to those qualifications. We don't have a right to take away from those qualifications. I occasionally have known some people, that, and they'll say, well, you know, we really need some elders, and this guy, he is really good, but, you know, he, he's, not really, he, he's not apt to teach. But we'll, we'll get him teaching. You don't have a right to ignore qualifications. I've sometimes seen people come along and they'll say, well, this guy, he's, you know, he's a preacher. He can't be an elder, and so we're not going to allow... You know, now you're making up qualifications. You can't add to qualifications. You can't take away qualifications. We can't decide we're going to have evangelistic oversight. I know a congregation in our area where the preacher oversees the congregation. That is not scriptural. We don't have a right to do that. Number four, we don't have a right to change the worship of the church. John 4, 24, God is a spirit. They that worship Him must worship Him in spirit and in truth. That means in spirit, your heart is in it, and in truth, according to the truth that He has given us. That worship consists of five acts, singing, preaching, prayer, the Lord's Supper, and giving. We must partake of the Lord's Supper every Sunday, Acts 20 and verse 7. And brethren, there's been a tremendous push to change the music in the Lord's church. God has asked for a cappella, that is for singing only. But I want you to listen to this. Jeff Walling really likes um, what they call praise teams. That is, they like a group of people who will lead. Sometimes they'll put microphones on certain people. Sometimes they'll have two men and two women stand up front and lead. Jeff Walling said, My commitment is to God's Word and doing things as effectively as possible. For that reason, I don't go around the country preaching against instrumental music. I go around the country preaching for praise and singing because some things aren't really important. You see, see what he says? This doesn't matter. He said, we, we've got to do, we, we've got to get people involved in praise. Some churches, in fact, the one where he was preaching did this, they have gone to two worship services. They have one that's traditional and, you know, it's the old stodgy people and they have a cappella singing and then they have a second service that is the contemporary service. And in that one, they'll have praise teams and guitars. Look up Providence Road Church of Christ and uh, look at their, the, the guitars they're playing in the worship service. We don't have a right to bring in female preachers. Now, this is a growing trend. It is widespread in the denominational world, but it's creeping into the Lord's church. 1 Timothy 2.12 still says, I suffer not a woman to, to teach, nor to usurp authority over the man. And yet... I want to read you this news excerpt. This is an article from last year, from May of last year, written by Steve Gardner. It's entitled, Most Church of Christ Colleges No Longer Exclude Women from Leading in the Worship Services. And then it gives a list of these schools. The article says, Seven of the twelve national and regional colleges that are affiliated with Churches of Christ no longer exclude women from actively serving in chapel worship services when men and women are both present. Four of them, Abilene Christian, Lipscomb University, Pepperdine, and Rochester, do not exclude women from any role in the chapel services. Women preach, read scripture, lead prayer, and otherwise actively serve in the chapel services when men and women are both included. Three other schools, Lubbock Christian, Oklahoma Christian, and York College, no longer exclude women from actively serving in mixed services. It says uh, these seven colleges are joined by a growing number of Church of Christ congregations that have list, lifted all or most restrictions on women serving in the worship service. Brethren, we don't have the right to do that. Why are people lifting these restrictions? Why have these restrictions existed in the first place? Because they got them from God's Word. So why are we now lifting them? We don't have a right to change reverence in the Lord's service, in the worship service. It is very popular today to dress down in the worship service. We are told 
casual is more pleasing to people. Well, that may be true, but it's not about people. It's about God. It is about reverence toward God. Next, we don't have a right to change morality. Now, I want to get very um, hitting home here in many congregations because in many congregations, well, let me be more specific. When I say morality, that's kind of a general term. Let's give some specific areas of morality. Number one would be modesty. Brethren, we have gone down this road in many congregations, even many that are conservative churches. Many churches don't preach on uh, morality. They don't preach on modesty. If they do, they're very apologetic about it. They preach so generically that people don't get it. They've so redefined modesty that it's hard to tell the difference between a Christian and the world. I know of one church that for 40 years they had preachers that preached solidly on this particular issue. They got a new preacher and he just tiptoed around it. Within just a few years the congregation had changed on this. One uh, person I know, a member of the church, told me that his preacher's stance was this. His preacher and his wife said, you can go to the beach where everyone is laying out nearly nude as long as, quote, your heart is right and you don't lust. I said, could you go to the beach where they're completely nude if you don't lust and your heart is right? If not, what's the difference in the two? You know, it used to be that the Lord's church was known for people who did not go mixed swimming. We had prom alternatives. We avoided things of this nature, but we're changing in this realm. I don't know why we're changing. The Bible hasn't changed on this, in this particular area. You know, 1 Timothy 2.9 still says that a woman is to dress herself in modest apparel. Matthew 5.28 still says that if a man lusts after a woman, he has committed adultery in his heart. Next, while we're, t while we're talking about morality, we don't have the right to change what the Bible says about drinking. When I was growing up, I don't remember ever hearing anyone in the Lord's Church argue in defense of social drinking. There probably were some out there, but I don't ever remember hearing it. I hear it all the time now. Members of the Lord's Church defending social drinking. Ephesians 5.18 still says, Do not be drunk with wine wherein is excess. People say, That just means you can't get drunk. Did you know in the original language that is methusko? It is an inceptive verb which literally means do not begin the process of getting drunk with wine. That's what it means. When do you begin the process of getting drunk with wine? When you take your first drink of alcoholic beverages. You have violated this passage. Next, we don't have the right to change what the Bible says about homosexuality. Now, we just had a whole sermon on this in Bible class, so I'm not going to go over this all, but I want to read you some statistics about this. These are stats from 2017, so they're two years old now. According to this uh, poll from Pew Research, amongst the silent generation, the silent generation is people born from 1928 to 1945, 41% support gay marriage. The baby boomers, that's people born from 46 to 64, 56%. Now notice, 41%, then 56%. The third one, this is my, my generation, Generation X, people born from 1965 to 1980, 65%. Notice how it's going up. The millennials, people born from 1981 onward, 74% support gay marriage. Brethren, I'm telling you, you give us 20 years when these people in this category are the age to be elders in the Lord's church, we're going to have problems with this in the Lord's Church. We have got to be dealing with this because it is not going to get better, it's going to get worse. Next, we don't have the right to change what the Bible says about entertainment. And we have gone down this road, even in many homes amongst faithful Christians, what we watch on television, what we go and see in the movies, the type of music that we listen to. We don't have a right to change these things. All right. Number one is things we can't change. We can't change things that are doctrinal. We can't change worship. We can't change morality. Number two, I want to think about, I talk about some things that we must change. Number one, we must change our methods. Now, what do I mean by that? I am the director of the Gospel Broadcasting Network. We are an organization that has as our entire goal to use every means of modern technology to reach people with the gospel. Now, what's the point? My point is technology is not bad. 
changing in that area is not bad. In fact, it's essential. Brethren, I believe that God has pro providentially provided us the awesome technology that we have today so that we can reach people with the gospel. I think on the day of judgment, if the Lord says to us, why didn't you take the gospel in all the, into all the world, somebody might be tempted to say, well, Lord, there were 8 billion people. How could we possibly take it to everybody? To which he may respond, why didn't you use, use the internet? Why didn't you use satellites? Why didn't you use smartphones? Why didn't you use Instagram? You see, I don't believe that the Lord has uh, given us... Um, this modern technology that we have so that we can binge watch Netflix. I don't think that's why we have it. I think we have it so that we can reach people with the gospel. And we need to use it that way. I grew up in North Charleston, South Carolina. And when I moved back there in 2006, I came back to be their preacher. And we had in our library, in fact, when I was growing up there in the 70s, we used the old Jewel Miller film strips. Y'all remember those? I'm not, I'm not talking about the VHS tapes. I'm talking about the film strips. And we had these little projectors, and they had little handles on them, and we would take these projectors out, and we would do evangelism. Well, when I moved back in 2006, we still had those in our library. And I remember we were talking about getting rid of them for space, and I remember one older member in, in her 80s, she said, we can't get rid of those. We're going to need those. I said, sister, we're not going to need those. We're not going to use those anymore. I remember when I was a kid growing up there, we had an old map. You remember the old big flip maps, the big cloth maps? It was a map of Moses' journeys in the wilderness. When I moved back there in 2006, which would have been, you know, 30-something years later, we still, I mean, it was an old, old map. We still had that same map. I don't mean one like it. I mean it was the very same. I think it might have been the same map that Moses used when he was traveling in the wilderness. And I'm kidding, but it was old. It was the same original map. What I'm saying is we need to modernize. We need to use things at our disposal to be effective. Brethren, we need to use... Churches nowadays need to have a website. You know, it is unlikely that you're going to be found in the Yellow Pages these days. We need to use things like Facebook. We need to use this technology that God has given us. We need to have a way to digitally record and to store our sermons, to distribute our sermons. We need PowerPoint. We need to constantly be reevaluating our methods. You know, the days of uh, tent meetings and door knocking is probably gone. Now, you know, I say that sometimes, and someone will come to me and say, well, Don, we door knock in our area, and it's effective. Then you ought to do it. That's what I'm saying. We need to reevaluate. If you live in an area where that is effective, then you ought to do it. We ought to be evaluating what is effective for us. Number one, we need to change our methods. we got to. Number two, we've got to change our facilities. Now, what do I mean by that? Have you ever walked into a building and it smelled old and musty and you went over to the track rack and you pulled one out and there was a tract on the hippie movement and Woodstock and you ever seen something? I'm exaggerating, but just a little bit because I've got a building in mind where I went in and found that. Now, somebody says, Don, it's not about the building. People shouldn't be coming because of the building. And that's true. It is not about the building, but what I'm saying is this. An old, musty building will deter people, and we want to be effective. That's what we want to do. We need to keep in mind that we're reaching out to a world that is filled with worldly people. And maybe a building shouldn't be a factor, but you know what? They don't know any better. They're not Christians yet. Why are we going to do something that's going to deter them? I know we've got to be good stewards in this area. I understand all those things. But I'm saying this is something that can hurt us if we don't do it. Number three, we've got to change our outreach, how we communicate. It is true. I have observed in the Lord's church that old habits die hard. You know, oftentimes I have observed in, in many places, in fact, most places, if you ask, why do you do things a certain way, you know what the answer is? Because that's the way we've always done them. But what I'm saying is, we need to constantly reevaluate and ask, is this still the best way to do it? Maybe it's time we stop mailing our bulletin and email our bulletin or text our bulletin or do something like that. Maybe it's time to put up a Facebook system. I don't know, whatever it is, we just need to reevaluate. Somebody says, well, you know what you're talking about? We tried that in 1976 and it didn't work. Maybe it didn't in 1976. We need to try it again. I tell you an area we're going to have to be thinking about is our giving. 
paper money is rapidly becoming a thing of the past. In fact, checks are rapidly becoming a thing of the past. My daughter and uh, her husband, uh, they were visiting with us a while back, and they made the point to me, they said, Dad, the only reason that we have checks anymore is to give to the Lord's church. They said if it weren't for that, we wouldn't even have them. Amongst millennials, checks are already a thing of the past. How are we going to deal with that? At the Gospel Broadcasting Network, we've been thinking about this because we thought if we don't make some changes, we're going to start losing contributions. Is the day going to come that we're going to have to pass a card swiper and everyone on Sunday swipes your card in worship services or everyone gets out your cell phone and uh, makes your uh, contribution that way? I don't know. I, I'm just saying we've got to think about it. You know, I said something like that in a service one time in Cookville, Tennessee. And afterwards, uh, the preacher said, you made me mad when you said that. And I said, brother, why? And he's like, ah, just because that's new. I said, well, that's my point. That's the point that I'm making. You know, I have heard that some brethren, when checks first came out years ago in our country, they were opposed to checks because they said it was like an IOU. They said you were giving it, but it actually didn't come out until the, uh, it cashed in the bank and you weren't giving on the Lord. And they had a problem with that. Why? Well, because it was new. My point is we need to constantly reevaluate and ask ourselves, is this the best way to do things? If we say it worked great in the 70s, that doesn't mean that it works great in 2019. First, things that cannot change. We can't change anything doctrinal. Things that must change. We've always got to think about our methods and being effective at reaching the society that we live in. Number three, I want to talk about some things that can change. I'm talking about optional things. I added this section because over the years, I have heard people say things like this. They will say, I remember when I lived in North Carolina, there was a, a, a town up the road and they had a Church of Christ. You move into a place as a preacher, you don't know about the churches in that area. And so I asked a brother, I said, the church up, up the road in that other town, are they a faithful church? This is what he said. He said, oh, no, Don, they're, they're not faithful. They don't meet on Sunday nights. Well, they might not be faithful, but it's not because of that, because the Bible doesn't demand that. You see, he'd made up a requirement. If we meet, I know that's our tradition in the Lord's church, but the Lord requires that we meet on the Lord's day. Would it be okay to meet once for five hours and then go home? Would that be all right? Would it be okay to do... I remember uh, an elder in the church uh, saying to me on one occasion, in the Memphis area, we call what we're doing here today, church eat church. Y'all call it that? You have worship, you have a fellowship meal, then you meet again. We call it church eat church. I remember him saying about a congregation, he said all that church eat church stuff, he said that, that's, uh, they're leaning toward liberalism. Brethren, there's nothing wrong. Is what we've done here today sinful? You see, the point I'm making is this is in the area of a can. This is something that the Lord has left to the discretion of the local congregation, and we need to stop calling people liberal or uh, 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 too strict based on things like that. If it's in the realm of judgment, don't bind. You can't loose, you can't bind where God has it. And if we start saying, well, they're liberal because of some made-up reason, you know what they're going to say? Well, those people over there make up stuff. How can you listen to them? We will kill our effectiveness if we do that sort of thing. Let me read you this conclusion. This is something Jeff Walling said. Jeff Walling said, It's an exciting time to be involved in Church of Christ ministry because, listen to what he says, old things are changing. Habits are being questioned. Old tradition. I mean, we've got the most sacred cows being trotted through butcher shops all over the country in churches of Christ where people are willing to ask questions that in the past would have been considered heresy. You know the sad thing? He's right. People are asking things that would have been considered heresy in the past. But you know, here's, here's uh, what I want to ask. I'm going to ask the original question again. I started by asking you, if the church doesn't change, it will die. Is that a true statement? I'm going to ask it again. If the church doesn't change, it will die. First, I don't believe that. I believe the best way for us to grow and to change is to be true to the book. Brethren, I believe we need to preach 
without apology. Sometimes I will hear uh, a preacher, usually a young preacher, and he will get up and he will say something that's semi-strong and he apologizes for it. I say, how dare we apologize for the Word of God? I personally believe if we had more hellfire brimstone preaching, we would have more baptisms and that we would have more restorations and more conversions. If you look at the time when the Church of Christ was one of the fastest growing religions in this country, we had hellfire brimstone preaching. Now somebody says, well, we're so thankful we don't have that anymore. We're not offending people, but we're also dying at an alarming rate. You see, what's the problem? When you will preach in a straightforward way, but you do it kindly and with love, you know, people can tell the difference. If you preach a straightforward message, but it is obvious that you love them, people will appreciate, some people will get mad, but they will respect you. You know, I've oftentimes used this illustration. What if you saw a car coming towards someone and they're standing out in the road and they're about to be hit and they don't see the car coming? Would you say, uh, excuse me, excuse me, sir, excuse me. Would you say that or would you say, get out of the way? What would you say? Now, you might startle them, but are they going to appreciate that? We see people who are going to lose their souls in hell, and we're worried more about offending those people. See, I think we've got a problem with this. It is interesting because I have asked this in several classes over the years. I have asked, how many people here obeyed the gospel because you heard a sermon dealing with hell or you were afraid to go to hell? Most of the time, the majority of the hands are raised. You see, Jesus spoke more about hell than anybody else in the Bible. Jesus tells us in Luke 13, 3, except you repent, you shall all likewise perish. That's the kind of preaching that would be offensive today. That is straightforward and in your face today. But it's the kind of preaching that saves souls. Except you repent, you shall all likewise perish. If the church doesn't change, it will die. First, I don't believe that. Secondly, even if it were true, we still can't change, not doctrinal things. Let me ask you this question. Do you think the day could come that the FCC would tell us at the Gospel Broadcasting Network that you can't preach against homosexuality anymore? You think that could happen? I think, I think it will happen. Not only can it, I expect the day is going to come. It, you think they could tell us you've got to be more inclusive and if you don't, we're going to pull you off the air. You think that ha could happen? I think it's going to happen. What should we do? Do we become more inclusive? Do we just accept that and press on? You see, we can't change in that area. If the church doesn't change, it will die. Number one, I don't believe that. Number two, even if it were true, we still can't change because it's not ours. We have to preach the same gospel from 2,000 years ago. Maybe you're here today and you're not a part of that one church. Maybe you're looking for that message that can save your soul from hell because you want to go to heaven. You want to have that peace of mind that I'm going to go to heaven when I die. The Bible teaches that you do that by being washed in the blood of Jesus. The way you are washed in the blood of Jesus is by hearing the gospel, believing it, repenting of your sins, confessing your faith in Christ, and being baptized in water for the remission of your sins. Maybe you say, I've never heard that in my whole life. I want you to sit down and show me. i got questions. I, I, can, I can prove you wrong. Let's sit down and study about that. Maybe you say, I'm ready. I want to be baptized. We're ready to assist you. Maybe you're a member of the church, but you've been unfaithful. Maybe you want to make your life right today. This afternoon, if you need to respond to the Lord's invitation, won't you come? So together we stand and sing the invitation song.